BMP for short, business management price. That's all that matters and really all that probably ever will matter when you're investing in anything, whether it's a public market stock or, you know, uh, deciding whether to go into business with a friend or open up a coffee shop. It's BMP. It's all that matters. So I recently finished your book, Where the Money Is. I know I'm a little late to the party, but uh, it was one of the best books I've read in a while. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, one part that really stood out to me was your BMP framework, which is a big part of the book. And I know you've discussed that before, but just for listeners who maybe aren't familiar with it, could you briefly describe it so they have a better understanding of what it means? Sure. Well, BMP, you know, stands for business management price. And it's basically, you know, the sort of compilation of 25 years plus on Wall Street, trying to figure out how to sort through the all the thicket of data that you're presented with uh, as an analyst. So I really, after 25 years, kind of figured out that, you know, the only three things that matter were the quality of the business, number one, the management that was uh, running the business and the price that the stock market was asking you to pay. So BMP for short, business management price, that's all that matters and really all that probably ever will matter when you're investing in anything, whether it's a public market stock or, you know, uh, deciding whether to go into business with a friend or open up a coffee shop. It's BMP. It's all that matters. Excellent. And so uh, you mentioned in your book that in the mid 2010s that you altered the price to earnings construct in two material ways. One, you looked out approximately three years for forecasting purposes. And two, you made adjustments to earnings power. If you had to guess, how big of an impact do these two adjustments have on your performance and your investing process? Oh, they were huge. I wouldn't have to guess. I, I, I know the numbers. Um, just to step back for a little bit, you know, I was raised, as I say in the book, as a kind of classic value investor. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, one that put price first. Price was the most important. And, you know, that, that, strategy has worked for, uh, did work for a lot of the 20th century. Uh, but uh, in the mid 2010s, as you mentioned, Kyle, I went through a miserable period of performance. I was buying cheap stocks. And, and I noticed that the underlying characteristics of the stocks that I was buying is that the businesses that I was buying were in decline. So they weren't cheap in the sense of favorably priced, they were cheap because their businesses were in secular decline. So all of these classic value metrics that I had grown up with, uh, you know, I had to really question, you know, the, the asset value, you know, the, the replacement cost of hard assets, you know, rail cars and uh, oil rigs and so forth. Um, you know, it, that wasn't as pertinent in the digital age as it had been, you know, 25 years ago. And, you know, even a cheap PE, a cheap price to earnings multiple didn't indicate good value. It could, it still can indicate good value, but really I learned that, you know, of those three variables, B and P, B was by far the most important. Um, and price while critical was sort of the last thing you ought to look at. So really, it was a it was a change in mindset from, as I say in the book, moving from a stock analyst where I'm just looking at the numbers to becoming a business analyst where I'm looking at the business and seeing if it has a rosy future and then looking at the management and seeing if they were good stewards of that business. And then finally looking at the price and saying, well, is that a fair price to pay as opposed to sort of putting the cart before the horse saying, oh, that's a cheap company. I'm going to buy it because it could just be cheap because it's, you know, it's best days are behind it. Yeah. One thing that I've, I noticed uh, cause I started kind of similarly to you where I was only looking at price. So I would look for cheap, cheap stocks. And then you would notice, like you said, this, the quality of the business wasn't very good. And then I, I kind of flipped it around exactly the way you kind of recommend in your book. So when, when you're looking at a business um, and you're looking first at business and then at management, will you, completely ignore price just to, to understand the business a little bit I better tried, before I it. try to. Yeah, I try to. Yeah, I try to I try to not even look at the price when I'm looking at a business. Um, 
because I don't want to be um, influenced. You know, I, I just want it's kind of like if you're shopping for uh, uh, it's a little different. But the, the analogy, I think, would help the, your, your listeners. If you're shopping for an apartment or a house, you know, first look at the house, then look at the neighborhood, then look at the school district and then say, well, you know, is the house worth it? Is it a good value for the money? You know, of course, whether you can afford it or not is a separate consideration. But, you know, there are times when, you know, great houses in great neighborhoods are worth paying for because the neighborhood is going to continue to appreciate. And conversely, there are times when, you know, rundown houses in, in, in rundown neighborhoods are not worth the cheap price that they're, you're paying for it because they're going to continue to degrade in, in quality and value. So the same is true of businesses in the stock market. Now, there are times when great houses in great neighborhoods are wildly overpriced. Right. And there are times when you know cheap houses in marginal neighborhoods are a great buy, maybe because the neighborhood's getting better. But if you keep if you keep it, you know, if you keep it in, in the uh, context of sort of real estate, which everybody's familiar with, whether renting or owning, you know, it's, it's price versus value. What am I getting and what am I giving up? Um, and, uh, you know, what you're getting is much more important than in many ways than what you're giving up. Excellent. I love that analogy. Um, so moving on to generally accounting, uh, generally accepted accounting principles, sorry, gap. Um, so you mentioned a little bit in your book that it's undergoing some modifications, but it's pretty slow in terms of catching up to what the, what the digital, digital age is um, requiring to show value. So how do you envision gap adjusting for changes in the digital economy, let's say over the next decade or so? Well, let's see, you know, I don't have that power. <laughs> I'm not on the financial accounting standards board, you know, and I'm not part of the SEC. Um, and it may be a little technical for your readers, but it is kind of intuitive when you understand that gap accounting was born uh, in the, in the uh, 1930s uh, after the depression, when the government rightly said, we need a better way to uh, have companies report the financial statements so that investors can rely on them. So that's what GAAP is, generally accepted accounting principles. So it's a standard of principles that all companies must adhere to. And the point I'm making in my book is simply that, you know, GAAP was created for the industrial age. Um, and it was created when steel mills and rail cars and factories, you know, ruled the economic landscape. So, um, the accounting is very appropriate for, for heavy industry, but these new digital beings um, don't look like factories at all. And so the principles of accounting that are almost 100 years old now are really sort of obsolete when it comes to capturing, you know, the expenses and the costs of a, of a you know, how, how, how Amazon is run, how Google is run, how Microsoft is run. The accounting really doesn't capture that accurately. So we'll see what, you know, the powers that be do in terms of catching up to the digital age. But meanwhile, what I decided as I outlined in my book is I've got to make the adjustments. You know, I don't, you know, just because gap is not, you know, God, you know, gap is, uh, a 90 year old set of principles that in my opinion have become outdated in many important ways. So I've got to, I've got to change and massage the numbers in ways that make sense economically to the current age. And by the way, I'm not the only one doing it. Other investors do it, but really the main people who do it are tech companies. Tech companies routinely change their numbers internally for their own consumption because they understand that it reflects economic reality to change the numbers. It's not magical thinking. It, it's actually more realistic thinking. Um, and so we need to act more like tech companies or even more broadly speaking, we need to just be rational business people and not get stuck in outdated ways of measuring value. Yeah. So I know in your book, you mentioned, um, for when you're doing your earnings power calculations, you mentioned a lot of R and D and marketing expenses. Yeah. So are there other areas of gap um, outside of those that you think 
uh, well, that you're well, sorry that you like to adjust for? Those are the most important, but I'll just give you a very simple example that maybe your listeners can can understand because it is you know ac- accounting is not for everybody. So, you know, when a when a company makes a marketing expense, when they they when they buy when they spit out uh, spend money to advertise their product or promote their product or give promotions or discount, you know, that marketing dollar has to be expensed a hundred percent in year one, as if it doesn't have anything more than a, a year of life. Uh, whereas a, a factory, what, if you build a billion dollar factory, you can amortize that factory. You can, you know, you can gra- recognize the costs in your profit and loss statement over 20 years. So a billion divided by 20 is $50 million a year is what you recognize, which makes you look much more profitable. But a company like Intuit, for example, they say, well, wait a sec, you know, our customers, when we get them on TurboTax or on QuickBooks, they last a long time, our customers. So when we spend marketing dollars, we're actually investing. It's almost like a factory. It's a long-term investment. It's not something that the marketing dollar doesn't have a one-year life. It has, say, a five-year life. So, so they, they adjust their marketing expenses and measure how much their marketing expenses is bringing in in terms of revenue. And, you know, that's as much in the weeds as we should probably get. But the net effect is Intuit's profits are much greater than, you know, the gap accounting statements, what have you believe. And that's the same. The same is true of most of tech. Excellent. You know, that, 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 that R and D is another expense, you know, research and development. That's, let me spend a minute on that. It used to be in the, you know, seventies and eighties, R and D was pure research and completely speculative. So the accountant said, well, we need to expense every dollar of research and development in year one, because we don't know if it's going to have a payoff. We don't know if it's going to be like a factory that can churn out stuff for 20 years. And that's that was a reasonable position to take. But that's still the position that Gap takes. And as I say in the book, it's kind of absurd that like, like Gap now is, is basically saying that every dollar that Amazon spends on their website to improve their e-commerce website is speculative and has a one-year life, has no value beyond one year. And every dollar that Google spends on their search engine is speculative and should be written off. And unlike a factory, has no long-term value to Google. And that, of course, that's just, everyone understands that that's absurd, that these are entrenched companies that are plowing research dollars back into their their uh, businesses to make their businesses bigger, their moats wider. And so, of course, they have a more than one year life. But Google's profits, Amazon's profits, and all tech companies' profits, by extension, that are in this category are penalized because instead of having a five or 10 year life, Gap says, no, you have to expense them all in year one. That's a great example. Thank you. So you make a point of emphasis um, that the management you're evaluating should think and act like owners. When you're evaluating a management team and see, uh, sorry, when you're evaluating a management team and see that they are thinking and acting like owners, what kind of insider ownership hurdles do you like to use, if any? You know, I don't necessarily need to see a lot of insider ownership. I mean, don't get me wrong, more is better than less. Um... But on the other hand, as I say in the book, Tom Murphy, you know, a, a legendary CEO from uh, Buffett's days who ran uh, ABC for many, many years, he owned, earned, he owned less than 1% of the stock. So he, when I make in the book, and it, which is really true, and I think people can, you know, understand this, your listeners can understand this from, from their own uh, experience, you don't need to to, to be an owner necessarily to act like an owner. You know, certain people are just responsible, considerate people and they treat your business, they treat your money as if it were their own and other people just aren't. <laughs> and you need to look for people who, you know, who are responsible, who treat their money who treat the business like it's their own, even if it's not. And, um, yeah, 
you know, that actually is not hard to spot. You, you know, if they, if they give themselves lavish pay packages, for example, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're taking advantage of, you know, being a public company. They're, they're, they're skimming off the top, essentially. If they pay themselves reasonably and, don't give themselves perks like jets and so forth. That's, you know, that's a good sign. You know, one of the reasons I'll probably never invest in an Elon Musk company, as I say in the book is I mean, clear red flag. You know, he owned, I think 17% of Tesla or 12% or something like that. And then he went to the board, you know, five or 10 years ago and said, geez, I, I think I need like 10 or 15% more of the company to really get up out of bed and be incented. So the, the board just sort of doubled his ownership stake by giving him a huge slug of options. It's crazy. Like all of a sudden as a shareholder, you know, I'm deluded because the board of my company has given the founder two times more ownership. Uh, that was to me a very bad warning sign. Of course, Tesla's done very well after that, but you know, I, I, I'm not going to lose sleep over missing Tesla because that kind of behavior is a little it's a little weird. Yeah, agreed. So you actually just mentioned Tom Murphy, who I admire greatly. Um, in your book, you have one line uh, that stuck out to me in regards to capital allocation. Um, so it quotes, the goal is not to have the longest train, but to arrive at the station first using the least fuel. So great businesses have high returns on capital. But the fear that investors should have is that competition will come and try to steal some of the profits for themselves. So what are strategies and tactics that management teams and digital businesses will need to use in order to help maintain their profits and stave away competition? Well, let's just back up and look at that Murphy quote, because it is a good one. You know, a, a lot of people in business, you know, they want the longest train. You know, in other words, they want a lavish headquarters and a lot of employees, a lot of people sucking up to them. So, you know, you should watch for that as, as a, as an investor, you know, so right now we're talking about the M in the BMP analysis, right? The management, like, do they want an empire? Are they empire builders or are they creators of shareholder value? They, do they want to have a big train or do they want to get to the station fastest using the least amount of fuel. So, you know, you want to look for people who are focused on, you know, the right things, which is making money and making money for, for shareholders. Um, and Murphy did that. Um, in terms of tech companies in specific, I mean, the way tech has, re the reason tech has gotten so big so fast and the way they can continue to grow and the way they can continue to protect their competitive advantage is to do what they've done all along, which is innovate. You know, tech, the, 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 the digital revolution is the biggest revolution we've had in a hundred years. And it's come because a bunch of smart people, you know, just got together in their garages and started to figure stuff out. So now Google is a huge company. Uh, Microsoft is a huge company. Um, Amazon is a huge company, you know, even this, this quote, second tier companies like Adobe and so forth into it are huge, huge multi hundred billion dollar companies. You know, the, their secret is to just keep doing what they're doing, not to get complacent, keep innovating, keep, uh, keep iterating, keep producing better stuff for people like, you know, Google got it to be where it is because it's the best, fastest search engine. And then they produced great maps and, you know, great email and a great browser. They need to keep doing this. Keep, keep innovating. Amazon, keep, you know, keep shortening delivery times. Keep delighting the customers. Intuit, keep innovating. Once a, once a company starts resting on its laurels and starts milking the business, that's when you're dead. That's when you're dead. And that's another reason why price matters less because... If you tell me, you know, that there's a company that um, trades for 30 times earnings, but is investing 10% of its uh, sales in R&D to keep innovating, and you ask me, you know, you know, just for academic purposes, a company that's trading for 15 times earnings, 
but is only putting 1% of its uh, money into R&D. I'm probably inclined to the 30 times company because two things. One, it's not apples to apples. The first company is, is, is taking earnings away from themselves today and investing it so that they have more money tomorrow. The second company is milking the business and, 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 and not innovating and thereby setting themselves up to have poor earnings down the road. So the earnings aren't comparable. So it's one of the many reasons why price is sort of the last variable. You want to say, wow, this is a great company. Um, wow, they're really innovating. They're doing great things for their customers. They're making life easy, easier, faster, better, cheaper for their customers. Okay, their multiple's a little high, but what if I adjusted their multiple so that they looked like an ordinary company that wasn't investing? And then, you know, sort of play around with, with the valuation and see if you can get comfortable with it. But, you know, once you start Stop innovating your debt. Um, I really come to believe, Kyle, that there are two kinds of capitalists and two kinds of capitalism actually in the world. There's the, the bad kind, the kind that gets publicized in the newspapers and movies, the greedy, short term. And that, you know, that definitely exists, you know, like a cable company, you know, like who loves their cable company? Nobody. You know, it's a monopoly. You know, they charge you a lot of money. They never innovate, right? They never innovate. They have mediocre service. Their prices go up every year. Every time you try to call them up, you get, you get, it's maddening. It's like living in the Soviet system. Those are, those are the bloodsuckers of capitalism. And th those, th I will never invest in companies like that because, you know, they're, they're setting themselves up for their own demise. Um, you know, the, the formal economic term for those people is rent seekers. They're just looking to squat on a piece of property and extract rent from you. That's the bad part of capitalism. I would put most banks in that category. Banks, cable companies, you know, the list is long. But then there's a second kind of company that is the good capitalist, where they're providing a market need they're, you know, they're producing a good or a service that is, it makes life easier, faster, better, cheaper. And in return, they're getting paid, you know? So, you know, like Google is like, all its products are free. Look how much better Google has made our lives. You know, um, I say in the book that the company that got me thinking about this sort of new paradigm was Heiko, which is in an old industry segment. It's aerospace uh, generic parts. It's generic parts for when aerospace parts wear out on an airplane, they sell at a 30% discount to GE and Honeywell and all these other branded guys who are, you know, are definitely bloodsuckers. GE and Honeywell think, oh, we have a monopoly on these parts. We'll just raise prices and stick it to the airlines. And along came Heiko 30 years ago and figured out, well, we could make parts that are safe and FAA approved, um, but that aren't name brand. And uh, we can sell at a 30, 40% discount to GE and Honeywell. And it took a long time for them to gain the trust of the FAA and of the airlines themselves. But now they sell to all the 20 major airlines. They've had, you know, close to 100 million uh, parts on a plane without any incidents. And the stock has been a monster. Um, and, you know, the, the owners are rich. The shareholders are rich. They have a stock option program. So the secretaries and the machinists on the assembly line are rich. That's the kind of capitalism I like. And that's the kind of um, company that I'm going to invest in. One that innovates. Excellent. So you mentioned Intuit a lot in your book and how they're able to beat com competition because of their incredible gross margins. And as you just said, with um, R&D, they obviously spend a lot more on R&D than they do compared to their competitors. But as a business like Meta has shown us in the past, the market can react negatively for a time to massive spending in these areas if they don't see value in it. How do you go about looking at a business's R&D and marketing history to ensure that they're spending that money wisely and that it's returning some form of value? 
The biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns, and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan, and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started. To break out of the treadmill of slaving away each week only to have nothing left over, watching the savings you do have get eroded away by inflation's vicious bite, or freeing yourself from the corporate grind requires that you master the conversion of time into value. To help you do this, we created a list of four simple steps to take control of your personal finances and life. You can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. I mean, it's pretty common sense, Kyle. You know, like, I, I don't know if I've act, ever used TurboTax, but I know people who use TurboTax. It's great. I've never used QuickBooks, but I know people who use QuickBooks. It's great. Like, that's there's a demonstrated need for that product. Uh, whereas something like Meta, you know, Meta, you know, bet the ranch a couple of years ago, changed their name and said, we're going to invest I think it was $10 billion a year in virtual reality. Well, that just, you know, that strikes me as highly speculative. You know, I, I, I'm not a venture capital investor. I'm not going to invest in unproven stuff that might work. I'm going to invest in stuff that, you know, while early in its life cycle has proof of concept that it's going to work. So QuickBooks has, you know, one, 2% market share of its ultimately addressable market of small business software, you know, helping small businesses keep track of their bills and invoices and so forth. You know, Meta has 0% of the virtual reality market because there is no virtual reality market. So, you know, it's common sense. It's like, I just thought I'm not, I'm not doing it. You know, Amazon, you know, retail, retail, U.S. retail sales, North American retail sales, e-commerce is about 15% of North American retail sales. Like that's just not a very high number. So it's already established and yet it has a lot of room to grow. Progressive, Excellent. progressive insurance, which is a tech, you know, really a tech company. It's, it's an auto insurance company, but it's really a tech company. It uses tech to, to gain its advantage. It has 15% market share. That, that number is almost surely going to go up. And meanwhile, you know, the auto insurance market grows. So once you find a company with a fairly small share of a large pie that it and the pie itself is growing, you know, good things are going to happen over time. Excellent. So there's a quote in your book on value investing that I really loved, which was the essence of value investing is to buy a stock when the market is voting on it and then wait until the market weighs it. This made me think that a lot of value investors tend to stay away from optically high priced tech names like we've been talking about. But if you know the value of a stock, regardless of its price to earnings ratio, all you need to do is wait for that stock to, um, uh, to, to wait, sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, all you need to do is wait for that stock until it is either not loved by the market and that drops the price of it, um, or is not loved as much as it should be, which you've, you've, you use your BMP system to do, and then just wait for the market to weigh it properly. So would yeah. that be kind of your advice to value investors who tend to avoid tech stocks based purely on price? Uh, no, my, my, my advice uh, to value investors who would avoid tech stocks on price is to sort of, you know, join me in a contemplation of what's changed in the world <clears throat> and to join me in a contemplation of how gap accounting doesn't capture uh, what's going on in terms of tech company value creation and sort of you know, you have to have, you have to change your mindset in the sense of, you know, tech is where the future is. Number one, like ask yourself rhetorically, Mr. Value investor, you know, where is most of the economic value going to be created in the next generation? You know, I'll give you four, I'll give you four choices, a healthcare, B financials, C industrials, D tech. I mean, I think it's, it's obvious to a 12 year old that the answer is D. So most of the growth in the economy is going to come from tech, number one. And then number two, how is tech not, how is the value of tech not captured fairly? Because as I say in the book, Kyle, like Google and Amazon and all these other tech stocks, you know, all of Adobe, Ansys, 
you know, uh, Salesforce, um, uh, Autodesk, all these companies, large and small, have always looked expensive from the time they IPO'd to now, but they've gone up tremendously. So either it's, 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 it's a binary, the answer to why, why have they gone up even though they've looked expensive is, is, is binary. Either, you know, it's a huge shell game that's been going on for 25 years now, and it's getting ready to, 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 to break, and it's going to make the dot-com bus look like, you know, a, a tea party, you know, and, 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 and Amazon and Microsoft and Google are going to go down 90% because they've just been air, or the way we're measuring value has just been wrong. It's outdated. I think the answer is pretty clear that the, the second explanation is true. So you've got to really reorient yourself both philosophically and numerically if you're going to capture, you know, the, 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 the value creation that the tech is, is, is generating. Excellent. So Benjamin, Benjamin Graham is often referred to uh, by Warren Buffett and other value investors in reverential terms. Do you think the fact that he's held on such a high pedestal actually does harm to newer investors who get stuck on his asset-based evaluation methods. Yeah, I do actually. And I think, I think it's a very insightful point you make. Um, look, I, I revere Graham as much as the next guy. I mean, he, he invented value investing, you know, before Graham, as I say in the book, the stock market was a casino and there was no systematic way to figure out how to invest and beat the market. And you know, one of his early jobs was uh, taking bets. He worked at a, he worked at a, you know, a New York stock exchange registered broker, but it was legal back then a hundred years ago to take bets on the presidential election. So he took bets from customers on the 1916 presidential election. Like that's how crazy wall street was back then. You think it's crazy now, you know, you could bet on the, they were bookies essentially. So he created a system, you know, what am I paying? What am I getting? you know, uh, pay, you know, don't overpay all these things are, you know, huge gifts that he gave to the investment community. At the same time, you know, he was way too conservative because he came of age precisely in a very speculative era. He lived through the depression in the thirties. So it paid to be conservative. And so Buffett went beyond him, uh, uh, and started paying higher prices for better businesses. Um, and I think that we need to keep going and, you know, uh, pay even quote higher optical prices, even though there's, they're really not higher prices for, for shares in tech companies. So yes, I do think that, um, to put him as sort of a, you know, he's a saint. He belongs in the value investing canon, but Times change, life moves on, and, and, our, and our attitudes have to move on too. Absolutely. So speaking of Benjamin Graham, in your book, you discuss the evolution of value investing, starting with value 1.0, which was inspired by Benjamin Graham's asset value approach. Then in value 2.0, you discuss Warren Buffett and his brand TV ecosystem. And then you present your BNP checklist for value 3.0. So as entire industries change, the way we evaluate must change as well. But what are some of the timeless investing concepts that continue to thrive from value 1.0 through to value 3.0? Yeah. Well, let me just set the stage for your listeners by, by saying, you know, value 1.0, Ben Graham was assets, as you say, you know, and not just assets, but what could they be liquidated for? You know, I own a company, a stock that has, you know, inventory of X dollars and cash of Y dollars and no liabilities and the, 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 the net assets are worth a hundred dollars a share. And I can buy the stock for $60 a share. I can buy it for 60% of liquidation value. Beautiful. Because the theory is that the $60 a share will inevitably go to a hundred to reflect at least asset value. That's, that's a very good construct. Buffett said, well, that is a good construct, but you know, I live after World War II. The U.S. is uh, in a very stable place. Um, we're growing. The, the, the economy of the U.S. is growing. Um, I want to buy great businesses. So I'm not going to look at assets so much as I am going to look at 
earnings. I'm going to look at their, their, their earnings and I'm going to be willing to pay it up. As I show in the book, there's a chart that shows he, he was, he was paying higher and higher multiples as time went on because his conviction that a great business would grow and would sort of outgrow the high multiple, uh, was, was that, that conviction that he had was increasing. So all I'm saying is, you know, we need to move on to the 3.0 where we don't focus on earnings, current earnings so much as earnings power, the latent ability of a company to earn money. Uh, as I said, when I compared the 30 PE multiple versus the 15 PE multiple, the 30 PE multiple company is much less expensive than it would optically appear because it's reinvesting to grow its future earnings. So those are the three constructs. Um, but look, you know, paying a fair price, that, that concept will never die. Being rational, that concept will never die. Um, getting good managers, that concept will never die. So there's a lot a lot of good still in investing, you know, that's why, you know, it's, uh, that's why I saw the subtitle of the book is value investing for the digital age. We just need to modify. We just need to modify. It's not a revolution. It's an evolution. Gotcha. So in the price portion of BMP, you are looking for a price to earnings of less than 20, implying a 5% or greater earnings yield. What is the significance of this earnings yield number? Well, I mean, the way I look at it is, you know, I, I, the, the multiple, of course, is the price over the earn, right? And, but the earnings yield is the earnings over the price. So E over P. So if I'm buying something that, you know, is earning $5 and the price is $100, the PE is 20 and my earnings yield is five. So the way I look at it, Kyle, is, well, Theoretically, if I own the whole business, I could take out that 5%. I would get a 5% dividend yield uh, on that business day one. Now, in, in practice, companies retain the earnings to grow and, or they buy back shares. Or, so it's not all dividended out to you, but it's a good theoretical construct. Day one, I'm getting 5%. Well, even in the rating, rising rate environment, that's still higher than a a government bond, right? Which is anywhere from four to five percent. So I'm getting paid more than the government would pay me. But in contrast to a bond, my coupon will grow, right? So five percent coupon, if it grows twenty percent, next year will be a six percent coupon. And if it grows fifteen, twenty percent, the next year it'll be a seven percent coupon and then an 8% coupon and a 9% coupon. So that's why one of Buffett's many brilliant insights was to say that stocks are bonds, but they have expanding coupons. You know, the 10-year treasury is not going to pay me more than 4 or 4.5%. Four it's not going to grow. It just sits there. But a dynamic business grows. It goes into new markets. It introduces new products. It raises prices. It innovates this. It innovates that. It cuts, cuts costs. It buy back stock, you know, which raises uh, my per share earnings value. So the coupons grow. So, so, so if I'm buying a great business, which I, you know, B is the first part of the analysis. If I've decided the business is great, it earns money the right way, not the blood sucking way. It's got a huge long runway. It's got a small market share of a large market. It's got competitive advantages. It's got reasons why it can continue to grow. Then, then I'm then I'm confident that that five percent coupon can go six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and in ten years, you know, it'll be the price will have been dwarfed by you know the earnings that are out there in ten years. So five percent seems like a good rough bogey to me. There's nothing magical about it. Excellent. So given the prevalence of monetization of data and attention these days, do you feel network effect moats are going to be an ever-growing area of competitive advantage in the industry, or sorry, in the digital age? Yes. Yes. I think that's a good insight. I mean, you see it now with AI, right? Um, you know, AI is all the rage, um, but the only companies that can really do it at scale 
uh, are the big companies, Microsoft, Alphabet, chief among them, because, you know, they have the, the cash flow to reinvest. And I think um, it's pretty widely acknowledged that Google has 75% of the top AI research talent. So, um, you know, that's, you know, that, that network effect grows there. It's, it's not just data, it's resources and, you know, an AI researcher, you know, like three good Google AI researchers could go off on their own and do a startup, but you know, they, they, they wouldn't have cash. They wouldn't have the resources. They wouldn't have the computing power. You know, they wouldn't have the, um, the market to sell into whatever application they, they, jo they created. So I think, I think, I think network effects and the mega caps are very much benefited. And, and as long as they continue to execute on innovating, uh, they will, they will do well. So outside of businesses such as meta, Amazon and alphabet, are there any other businesses that you think are worth, um, uh, researching more to understand network effects or can you just get away with studying kind of those, those, uh, those big, well, major I mean, guys? You, you know, you kind of know a network effect business when you see it here again, it's important not to get too caught up in the theory and just sort of, you know, be, be practical about it. like Airbnb, like, like they started with the, their apartment, you know, and, uh, and it's called Airbnb cause they, they blew up a mattress and put it on their, you know, that air mattress, uh, on their, on their, uh, on their floor of their living room. So, you know, start out with one host and then one guest and then, two hosts and two guests and then four and then 16 and network effects. And, and the more hosts, the more guests and the more guests, the more hosts, you know, like that, that's all. So, you know, if you keep that in mind, you can see immediately whether a business has network effects, you know, one begets the other virtuous circle, whatever, however you want to say it, uh, flywheel. There are a lot of t business terms to describe it, but, you kind of know it when you see it, you know, uh, Facebook social network, you know, uh, people are on there. That means more people come on there, which means more people come on there because uh, it's a social network, you know, um, it's, it, they're not hard to spot. Excellent. Uh, so you had a really good breakdown of the contrasts of a financial or stock analyst versus a business analyst in your book. You said, and I quote, a financial analyst believes that the numbers drive performance, but a business analyst knows that the numbers, the ratios, and the stock's performance all derive from one thing, business quality. For listeners who are accustomed to looking at investing through the lens of a stock analyst, what would be their first steps into evolving into a business analyst? Well, it's one of the favorite points in my book and one of the really more profound realizations I've come to. You know, I used to be a classic value investor, price first, numbers first, quantitative, quantitative, quantitative. And I just understood that business quality, you know, not only dwarfs the numbers, but it drives the numbers. That's where the numbers come from. Good businesses are going to generate good numbers. Bad businesses are going to generate bad numbers. So General Motors sure looks cheap, but what kind of numbers is it going to be producing going forward? Um, so it's really, I would encourage people to just sort of think that way, you know, like just like, I don't know. People have to come to their own conclusions, but for me, I got tired of buying into businesses that looked cheap and just kept going down. Um, you know, the <clears throat> business quality rules, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's, if we don't have enough evidence of it by now, I don't know what more evidence we can have. So you just need to deeply think about, okay, I own businesses X, Y, and Z, and they're cheap optically, but what is their quality? Like, what is their future? And what numbers are they get producing in five years, three years time? Whereas if I bought business ABC, Okay, it's optically more expensive, but what what's it going to look like in three or five years' time? Quality wins. Gotcha. So a new investment that you have just made is in Texas Instruments. Could you go through the business and management part of your BMP network, or sorry, uh, BMP framework on the business um, with me to help it, the audience understand it a little bit better? And then I want to go over the uh, price in a bit. Sure. 
Yeah, happy to. BMP analysis for Texas Instruments, a good a good case study. So Texas Instruments is uh, involved almost 100% in a in a in a mark tech market segment called analog semiconductors. And I learned about this five or six years ago, and it was a real eye opener for me. I always thought that semiconductors were, you know, the chips that went into uh, memory and storage, you know, Intel and so on and so forth. And that's a much bigger industry. That's digital chips. That's zeros and ones. Uh, that's digital semiconductors are ones that just uh, manipulate digital data. Um, and that's a, a huge, it's a very difficult business, actually, digital semiconductors. It, it requires scale, you know, enormous fabs costing billions of dollars. Um, product cycles change every couple of years. So you see now that NVIDIA is the darling because of their AI chips and Intel is in the doghouse because they missed the transition. So I don't like that business. It's capital intensive. Product cycles go change every couple of years. Um, scale matters. And, and the risk of missing a product cycle and becoming a laggard it's just well documented. I mean, um, you know, Andy Grove, the best CEO in the semiconductor industry, maybe ever. You know, you know what the title of his autobiography was? You, Only the paranoid me. survive. Only the paranoid survive. Like, do you want to be in an industry where only the paranoid survive? I don't. Like, that's hard. I'd rather be in an industry where like a lazy guy can do okay. <laughs> like that would be good. But um, so I don't like the digital semiconductor industry terribly much. I mean, those who bought NVIDIA because they saw something, I mean, hats off to them. But but NVIDIA has to be paranoid now because another product cycle will come. So Texas Instruments is not in that segment. They're in the analog segment, which is much smaller segment. It's maybe a fifth of the size of the digital segment. But analog has means anything that has to do with non-binary, non-digital, non-zeros and ones. So analog semiconductors basically help get real world phenomena into the digital ecosystem so that NVIDIA's and, and Intel's chips can analyze the data, manipulate the data, store the data. Uh, so driverless cars is a great example. So there's a lot of digital chips in there to tell the car what to do. For, their, for those digital chips to work, they have to have sensors outside of the car. Noise, temperature, movement, those are all analog signals that move in waves. Sound waves, you know, uh, power moves in waves. Analog semiconductors capture all the non-digital phenomena in the world, all the real-world phenomena, temperature, sound, noise. Um, and those can't be shrunk. Uh, those semiconductors can't be shrunk because they'll lose their fidelity beyond a certain amount. So Moore's law does not apply. So the ruthless economics, the only the paranoid survive economics do not apply to analog. So that's great. Um, the other thing that's great about analog is you can't have one chip for a hundred applications. You, you know, the, the analog chip that regulates the power in the iPhone is different than the analog chip that that uh, hears your voice, which is different than the analog chip that met, monitors the temperature, which is different than the analog chip that helps when you swipe your phone. They're all little niche industries. They're all little niche. So so so, I, I think I I can't remember the numbers exactly, but I think you know Intel has maybe fifty SKUs, you know, different units. And, and Texas Instruments has over 100,000, like all little bespoke things. And, and, and it's not an industry where only the paranoid survive because once you get a good power regulator or once you get a good sound conductor, it's probably good enough for five or 10 years. So you don't have to keep iterating. And the product cycles aren't uh, rapid, which allows an analyst, a business analyst, to understand the long future. So here we so. And yet, at the same time, they're exposed to all the tech uh, tailwinds, right? They're exposed to digital uh, driverless cars, Internet of Things, anything that needs, uh, you know, human or real world phenomena to be translated into the digital world. 
needs analog semiconductors. And of course, we know that that number is just going to keep going up. So I love the analog semiconductor business. Texas Instrument is the market leader, um, but they only have 15% share. So it's still pretty fragmented market, but they're the market leader. So the, the market grows, I don't know, seven, eight, nine percent a year, which is much better than the underlying economy of two to three percent. And Texas Instruments grows a little faster than that because they're always taking share because of their scale. So um, the top line for Texas Instruments can grow 10 percent a year. And then the other thing I love about Texas Instruments as a specific analog business is they're the only one that own their own factories. Everybody else has outsourced their factories, are fabulous. So they do a lot of work with Taiwan Semiconductor, which is a great company. But Texas Instruments gains a lot of manufacturing advantages from owning their own factories because they don't have to pay a middleman. They're vertically integrated. So that gives them a cost advantage. So not only do they have the broadest product portfolio, and because of the market share leader, they can invest most in R&D in terms of absolute dollars, but they also have a cost advantage. So, you know, I'm starting to tick off, you know, market leader, spend the most in R&D, cost advantage in this great niche industry. So I'm loving Texas Instruments. You know, this I'm kind of going back through my research as I learn all this stuff. And um, so it's a great business. I think it'll probably, over time, it'll grow revenues 10%. The margins will increase a little bit as they gain scale and leverage. And then they'll buy back stock. So I think that, you know, the earnings growth for them per share is probably in the mid-teens for forever. You know, forever is a long time, but for for at least 10 years. So a company that can grow earnings 15% for 10 years time and has sustainable competitive advantages in this great little niche industry is a wonderful business. Now, the multiple, so that's, oh, so that's the business. The management is great. They don't own a lot of stock, but, you know, they'll quote Buffett, they'll quote Graham. You go on their website, they have a whole dedicated uh, slideshow to capital allocation. Like they understand what drives value. They understand return on capital. They, they make all their investments based on return on capital. They are interested in getting to the, the station fastest with the least amount of fuel. They do not want to build a big fancy train. So the management definitely gets it. And, and you know, you, you just spend a little time on the website and you listen to their investor calls and you'll see that they they are shareholder friendly and, and investment savvy. So, OK, so my B's checked, my M's checked. And then the price, you know, this is a good example of sort of a more ordinary earnings adjustment. But so optically, like this year, they're going to earn seven dollars and change and the stock's one hundred and sixty. So let's call it a low twenties multiple. So it doesn't pass my test of 20 and under, right? But if you study the market, which I have now for five or six years, you'll understand that they're in a, in a lull. See what happens is customers like automakers and, and, and auto and industrial is most of their markets now auto and industrial. And, and, and those guys will order a lot of chips and demand will grow a lot. And then they'll say, oh, we're overstocked. And so they'll cut back on their orders. And then they'll run their inventories down and then they'll overorder. Then they underorder, they overorder, under. So it's lumpy, cyclical a little bit. And, and we're right now in kind of the, getting toward the bottom of where the manufacturers have underordered. So the $7 and change earnings number is probably a, a false number. It's probably too low. Like I, if I just do my numbers uh, and correct for the inventory adjustments, I think they're going to earn twice that in four years. They're going to earn fifteen dollars or so in in twenty twenty seven. That's kind of my estimate. I'm only thing I know is it's going to be wrong, but it's directionally accurate. So if you if you adjust the earnings to compensate for this inventory correction, it's trading well under twenty times. So. All three boxes checked, great business, savvy management, good price. You have to watch out because, you know, China is a wild card now. There's all these trade tensions and, you know, Apple is, uh, uh, Apple's phones are now not being allowed by some government employees. So 
you know, there's going to be some stuff going on in here, but, but overall, what I've told you is, is, is undeniably true. Excellent. So part of the reason the dot-com businesses didn't work out uh, around the year 2000 was that the infrastructure wasn't in place to support those businesses. As you mentioned in your book, it was the same with cell phones. They became more ubiquitous as the technology got better and the prices came down. What industries or sectors are coming online today that you envision having long tailwinds? Oh, there's so many, you know, there's so many. I mean, AI is all the rage. I mean, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but, you know, it's going to it's going to be big. And it'll, as I said earlier, it'll probably be, you know, monetized by the big guys, Microsoft in its office suite, you know, charging money to have you use AI in Word and Excel. Google, it'll help uh, in their search uh, business. I mean, you know, I don't even really try to bother to count the ways or the next big things. I just know they're going to be big things. I mean, this year it's AI. At some point, driverless cars will hit, you know, and then quantum computing is going to hit. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't bother ticking off all the ways. Of course, I'm familiar with them, but I just, I say to myself, like, you know, what is going to be driving the incremental value of the economy for the next generation? As I said earlier, like it's, it's, it's going to be tech. Excellent. Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining me today. Before we say goodbye, uh, where can the audience connect with you and learn more about you and your book? Kyle, I enjoyed it and you asked good questions and I hope it benefited your listeners. Uh, in terms of connecting with me, you know, I mean, here's the book. All that stuff we've been talking about, you know, you can just pick it up on Amazon or your local bookseller if you want to, uh, you know, uh, help support them. And then, you know, look, uh, um, you can Google me. Uh, I'm on the web. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, happy to chat with anybody. And, um, you know, I've, I've kind of figured out how to invest uh, with discipline, using some of the traditions of value investing, but also making accommodations for this new digital reality that we live in. So I'm happy to help others if they want to continue their journey as well. I think the biggest difference between growth and value investors is how far into the future they're willing to look. A growth investor is often trying to make an estimate of how the next decade or two will be different than the present is. And we, like most value investors, think our crystal ball gets cloudy much faster than that. So we don't ever want to invest in a company where you need to have it sell at more than a market multiple seven years from now to justify the price that you're paying today. 